OSM is the Open Service Integration Maturity Model. It's an open group standard that's available in both PDF form from the Open Group Bookstore and an HTML form from the Open Group's whole page. Our presenter today will be Andras Zako. Andras is an IBM Distinguished Engineer and Chief Architect of IBM's Federal Software Business Unit. Andras is also an Open Group Distinguished Certified IT Architect, an IBM Certified Civil Solution Designer, and a Certified Secure Software Lifecycle Professional. His responsibilities at IBM include developing e-government software architectures using the IBM middleware and leading the IBM U.S. Federal Software IT, IT Architect team. Andras has been the driving force behind IBM's adoption of the federal government IT standards and is a member of the IBM Software Group Government Strategy Standards Team. His team has been responsible for helping the federal government move e-government into an on-demand era through the application of SOA and cloud computing. He's also a member of the Security Architecture Board and Secure Development and Cybersecurity. So not only is Andras an expert with SOA, he's also an expert in security. Andras represents IBM on the Board of Directors of the Open Group and currently holds the Chair of the IT Architect Profession Certification Standard within the Open Group. Andras did lead the OSIM Standardization Workgroup and resulted in the OSIM Standard in August of 2008. And he's currently working with Heather Krieger, myself, and others to have OSIM approved as an ISO standard. Well, thank Heather, you. thank you very much for that incredible introduction. Uh, this is Andras Sakal again, and uh, we're here today to talk about the OSIM standard, which stands for the Open Group Soil Maturity Model Standard. It is actually not your traditional standard uh, as in APIs. This is a technique, um, and we're going to kind of walk you through the value as a practitioner of using and applying that technique. So w there are actually multiple tutorials, some of which are already online for your uh, use. Uh, we are going to actually be talking about this OSIM, but in the past we've done the impact of SOA on business. I think Heather uh, is one of the folks that contributed to that. SOA governance, uh, architecting SOA and developing a SOA using TOGEF, the uh, open group uh, architecture framework, and then implementing SOA. So if you're interested in those, by all means, download them and use them. Today we're going to essentially focus on four major areas. Uh, we're going to do an overview of OSIM. Uh, we're going to use our DDB or Dursley drill bit uh, company use case and case study uh, to, to review how we might as practitioners apply OSIM. And we'll you know, use industry standards as a method to foment discussion and and come up with some conclusions and uh, hopefully take some of your questions. So what is OSIM? So OSIM is essentially three, has three different major facets or elements to it. It's a service integration maturity model. It helps us understand how we can more effectively integrate SOA services and, you know, we are all talking about cloud computing these days, so cloud computing as well. Uh, it, in a, a fashion that helps transform our business. Uh, it's also an extens extensible maturity framework. So it's not static. It's meant to actually be modified and used in the context of the organization looking to transform. And it also, in that context, provides a process for the maturity assessment. So OSM helps define a roadmap for uh, transforming your business. Uh, it's an, it, it defines an incremental uh, approach to taking SOA or services uh, and adopting those SOA and services, uh, SOA services or cloud computing services in the context of a business transformation, right? So we don't simply take technology and, and, uh, and apply it willy-nilly, right? We always do this uh, as effective architects and practitioners in the context of the business problem, in the context of business transformation. 
So it allows us to uh, understand how we would approach the implementation of both business process and technology uh, in, in, as it exists today and, and how it must be implemented in order to achieve our goals or strategy. And it does this in the context of multiple dimensions, so the application dimension that we're all very familiar with. Um, how we actually are going to approach the implementation of these services, uh, whether they be true SOA, internal services, or cloud services. What, is the, what are the government, governance mechanisms? What are the methods that we might apply? Um, how do we manage information in this context? How, uh, what are the uh, implications to operations? All of these different dimensions have to be considered as we move from our current state to a future state of, uh, of both IT implementation and operations as well as the business processes uh, that sit on top of our IT infrastructure. And our strategy, our goals, our priorities and imperatives um, help inform the, this transformation process. So priorities, may, when I say priorities, I'm talking about business priorities and strategy. When I'm talking about imperatives, I'm really talking about those you know, requirements to implement um, applications in a certain way that your organization or government or entity that's using this might have defined as part of their enterprise architecture. Let's make sure that I all right, okay. Um, so this is the uh, OSIM maturity matrix. So at the top of the OSIM model, we have the ma maturity matrix, and it's a seven by seven matrix, which defines uh, maturity levels and the dimensions. So we're interested in, in these different dimensions, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, that are important as we transform our business and technology infrastructure to adopt the, as we go through the maturity process, to adopt the different technologies and business approaches that are necessary for us to meet a certain set of objectives. So some of the dimensions are, as you see uh, in the, the vertical on the left-hand side, are the business view. So what are our business objectives? What are our business processes? Um, how are we governing uh, this transformation process? What is our organization like? Uh, how are we organized and how should we be organized in order to actually achieve this transformation? What methods do we utilize? It? Um, and, and, you know, this is not only about technology methods. This is not just about uh, design methodology. This is about how we actually approach the end-to-end business to IT transformation, right? So there are multiple methods that may be at play here. How are the applications constructed? Uh, how do we approach the implementation of the architecture, right? Um, information is very important. So the structure of information, the governance of information, um, how we actually have our master data models established as we move to a distributed service-based infrastructure is going to be very important. And um, obviously, how we manage that, secure that, um, and operationalize uh, the service infrastructure is also quite important. Now, uh, across the horizontal, you see that we have um, different levels, level one through seven. And we also name these levels. We, we use the names interchangeably. Uh, at level one, we have silo. Level two is integrated. Level three is componentized. Four is services. Five is uh, composite services. Six is virtualized services. And uh, level seven is, well, it's nirvana, right? No, it's, uh, seriously, it's uh, dynamically reconfigurable services, which is a mouthful for basically the ability to have your services um, dynamically change as business dynamics change, right? So your infrastructure makes changes as uh, the surrounding business environment changes, which certainly is, to some of us, maybe nirvana. But it, it really is the goal of cloud computing and service-based um, implementations. 
So if we you know look at a, a few other elements of this model, we see that we have these th this this piece that's uh, sort of orange called the service foundation levels, and those are uh, the levels that are necessary to achieve what we call pure SOA services. Um, and we we actually did kind of consider leaving that out of the model, but then we would be leaving behind some really important background information and experience and expertise uh, in so much as that uh, we have to transform most of our applications, even today, even if they're service-based, from the silo point of view. Because if you're doing an M&A, if you acquire a new company, you often find that maybe a line of business created a uh, capability of some sort. They operationalized it, and it's really very siloed. It can be siloed with respect to the information it uses and shares. It can be siloed with respect to uh, how many services it can interoperate, the platform, so on and so forth. So it's inf it's really important to realize that you know siloed applications are not simply going to go away um, because we move to a service-based infrastructure. And and how you actually integrate those is important, and then componentize those and break those down into consumable pieces, which we can use as services, is also uh, very relevant to the implementation of SOA and cloud computing. So let's take an example here of uh, what we call level five architecture domain uh, of the level five architecture domain and their attributes. And we're also going to use um, the evolving uh, open group uh, reference architecture uh, to help define this maturity. So there are some fundamental attributes of composite services, or level five. Um, now, we've already achieved service enablement, right? So, so we're one level above that on the matrix. And the fundamental attributes of a composite services are that we're using some sort of registry and repository to enable the the management, the government, the reuse, the visibility uh, of services themselves. And we're basing the implementation of our services on some sort of business process language, right? We can define business process above and beyond simply the service components themselves. We know that we probably are going to do this with some sort of enterprise service bus, and we're going to need an enterprise service bus for integration, transformation, um, routing, and all sorts of other uh, services that are that are that are part of an enterprise service bus. And we're we're very focused, as I said before, in adopting some sort of business process modeling capability. We have to be able to model our business processes. We have to adopt the standards which define those models, and we need to be able to monitor them in, in situ, in real time. We also believe that there are some common security services at, that you're going to need in order to actually truly be uh, service-based, um, especially in this day and age when we're all worried about cybersecurity. Now, within each um, element of, of the model, we also have evolving attributes. That is, that attributes which you will need to achieve or sh should be looking to achieve in order to meet the next maturity level. And in this particular case, um, you know, it's use of master data management. Um, we're, we're working hard at, at level five to integrate our data in a way that it gives us a single view. Do you have to integrate all the repositories to do that? No. You implement a master data uh, management uh, service. There is uh, operational virtualization, which is occurring across the infrastructure. Um, we're also looking to achieve business process monitoring and management. We can actually change our services, or at least perceive the necessary changes, by effectively monitoring our business processes. And as we go to a service-based or cloud infrastructure, one of the most important elements of operationalizing your implementation is the, the ability to understand the implications of use as well as debugging. Now, when we have distributed components working all, you know, actually dislocated from, from your um, current uh, environment, some, you have a business process uh, that's running in a partner 
infrastructure and you don't have authority over it uh, and maybe even the visibility you'd like to have, you actually must implement in your environment business process management more effectively so you can understand maybe where exceptions occur. Without that, you will never achieve level six or seven. And of course, we have an evolving uh, need for, for integrated identity management, those security services that uh, are necessary to be able to manage identity across an end-to-end -end business process, whether they're owned, whether those business processes are directly owned and operated by your organization or not. And, and in those cases, that's, that's probably even more important. And therefore, you must have some sort of established security policy management in place, too. Now, if you look down at the uh, lower left-hand uh, part of this chart, you see that uh, this is our SOA reference architecture, and this part of the original paper that we published uh, within the open group on, on this particular subject. And we're hoping to actually finish the standardization of the RF soon, on the RA. Um, and uh, we're going to use that uh, and to extend OSIM later on. Now, the majority of what you're seeing here at level five is occurring in this business process layer here uh, in the reference architecture. And so you can see in the business process layer that you're, you're, you have composite uh, capabilities. You're beginning to see uh, the development of business processes um, uh, across the different services. So you're managing the different services as processes themselves. So stay tuned on the reference architecture. I know Heather is looking for that one to close here soon. Let's talk a little bit about a case study because we're here to talk about how, as pr practitioners, we're going to apply um, OSIM. So if you've done any reviewing of the, uh, these particular seminars, you know that we have uh, a case study that we use called the DDB group case study, which stands for the Dursley Drill Bit Group. Now, the Dursley Drill Bit, bit Group is a company that, that manufactures manufacturing components. So drill bits, cutters, all sorts of new widgets uh, or, or widgets in, in general necessary for manufacturing. Um, and that is they've even gotten into robotics later on uh, downstream. They were formed, they're, they're a long-lived company. They were formed in 1882. They had success because they basically provided the best quality products. They were, had a patented product, product line. Uh, they protected those, those products uh, and those patents effectively. Um, and I would say that probably they became very successful mostly because they had such quality, high-end customer service. Um, and they moved beyond simply Europe to... Uh, grow go globally, and uh, they've implemented uh, this this growth through acquisitions and some semi-autonomous operational implementations. But things are changing here at DB, DDB. Their competitors are biting at their ankles, and uh, they need a united front to the customer. They have to establish this global branding, and they got to look more like one company instead of a bunch of segmented businesses. This reminds you of somebody. Um, they need to reduce their administrative overhead in this environment, and they need to prever uh, preserve uh, specialist production processes and rationalize uh, their post-production processes. So they really want to be able to do on-demand manufacturing, and on-demand manufacturing means that they have to have a view into their business partners' uh, environments, and there has to be direct integration with those business partners and customers so that they can actually obtain orders for parts in real time, manufacture them, provide them as needed instead of holding an inventory, which uh, is evolving quickly, and holding any inventory on the shelf is a liability because li liable to be out of use um, or val less valuable as we move into the future as, as, as their business product partners' products evolve. So they produce high-end drill bits, like I said. They're preferred supplier to major machine manufacturers, um, so on and so forth. I think I, I caught you up on all of uh, those assets. Uh, facets, I'm sorry. So what's most important here is that DDB must participate in a global manufacturing 
uh, value chain and those partnerships. They have to stay competitive, grow their business in emerging markets, and embrace industry standards. Almost underneath their feet, the industry has been collaborating and coming up with new standards so that they can integrate across the, the value chain effectively. And the, you've, you've got all sorts of changes that are now putting pressure on DDB sales and revenue. So this is our top level chart for DDB. And this shows that they have uh, their traditional ordering mechanisms. They have uh, order management um, components. They have a production management uh, capability, which is connected to each of their production facilities that are um, aligned with dispatch management uh, and effectively one-off integrations with online ordering. It's not particularly well integrated. It's, it's basically you got a graphic. <laughs> You put one of these in, and, and so it's not integrated with their business partner supply chain. Financial control is also an issue, uh, as well as group dispatch management. So we want to make some significant changes here, right? And DDB looked around, and, uh, and they said, well, what, is, what are these evolving industry standards that we can leverage? And what they found was that there was a group called Mimosa. Now, Mimosa is an alliance of of operations and maintenance uh, solution providers and companies who are focused on developing this, you know, capabilities that allow you to have uh, an integrated supply chain manufacturing process. So all the way from build to deliver, and they define the the different, uh, you know, data structures and XML specifications necessary for the industry. Um, they also have implemented what they call uh, a, a, an integration architecture, we'll, we'll see. So in finding Mimosa, they said that this is a perfect opportunity for us to a, become aligned with Mimosa and implement OSA EAI, which is uh, the open systems architecture for enterprise application integration. And, there's, and they believe that this is a way that they can actually advance their transformation uh, by using these industry standards in a, in a, in a way that's going to be game changing. Um, now, that's all well and good, but they had to have some sort of reference architecture against which to implement their transformation. And what they found was that Capgemini and IBM had come up with uh, a Mesa manufacturing industry SOA reference architecture. And they really found that the, uh, the reference architecture and the requirements uh, and the steps that were laid out and the actual consulting there, maybe that was behind it, was, was all something that, they, they, that resonated with their business leaders and uh, it made it clear as to how they actually might be able to transform. Now, they also knew they had lots of work to do across their organizations to make this transformation necessary. And they knew it had to become stepwise, otherwise they were going to fail. Stepwise and evolutionary. So here is actually, this is, this is not a, a, an imaginary case study. There really is a paper out there that Capgemini and IBM led, which uh, speaks to the implementation of SOA using the MESA standards. So you can look it up uh, at that link, hopefully. So our strategic direction is we really need to focus on this group uh, dispatch management solution. Uh, the business process services and infrastructure that will they'll make up that solution. And we have to uh, form a solution platform, a, I'm sorry, a services platform that can also support uh, other solutions such as order management and production management. Um, as the industry moves to these open standards. Uh, so they're going to embrace MESA. They're going to actually use um, the, the IBM uh, Capgemini reference architecture. But how are we going to achieve that? Well, we're going to adopt OSIM. We're going we're to actually do an OSIM assessment uh, on DDB. 
and we're going to use that as a method to help bring together our line of business stakeholders with our IT stakeholders to ensure they understand what is necessary for them to transform their business. So this is a mind map I came up with. This is not actually part of the original OSIM uh, specification, but you know, here it is in this uh, presentation. Use it as you see necessary. We decided we needed some way to visualize how all these pieces and parts of the assessment and OSIM fit together. So if you look on one end, uh, the left end, you have EA and SOA strategy. So you, we, we've defined our enterprise architecture and SOA strategy, and you have to have an enterprise architecture or some sort of business transformation strategy as the starting point for doing any OSIM assessment. If you If you don't have some sort of visionary transformation objective in mind, or if you don't have an enterprise architecture which defines all of the pieces and parts of your organization and how they fit together, you're going to have a hard time adopting OSIM. Now on the right-hand side, uh, what we have is essentially the model itself, the OSIM model, and the, the maturity indicators uh, and, and, and the base indicators that we use uh, and will modify as we move forward. Now, uh, the assessor um, collaborates with the organization, which determines the enterprise architecture and SOA strategy, and informs the target SOA maturity model. So, what uh, our SOA strategy and our enterprise uh, the, the the SOA strategy and the enterprise architecture constitute our TOA, SOA target. Our, sorry, our target SOA maturity. And it provides us input into the assessment report. And the assessor is responsible for customizing the maturity model, the maturity indicators, and the current and, and determines the current so maturity and uses that as input into the assessment report as well. Eventually, we're able to describe a SOA roadmap for implementation and adoption. So let's talk a little bit about um, maturity indicators and attributes. Uh, in the model itself, uh, you have many different indicators. They're like guideposts that help you understand um, by level uh, what uh, observable elements of maturity are necessary for us to achieve that particular level of SOA maturity for that dimension, right? So in this case, we have I'm showing here your maturity indicators for the business dimension and a componentized uh, or level three business uh, maturity indicator is in the base model formal definition and documentation of the organization's business drivers and processes. Now for each maturity indicator or guidepost, right, you have a set of attributes. A set of attributes lead you to um, make a decision about or determine uh, the uh, maturity level within that um, dimension. So in the case of uh, this particular example, the cro there are cross-organizational maturity attributes, right, at level three componentized. And, and here it says some formal enterprise architecture constructs exist, and the organization's business drivers are documented as cross-organizational business objectives. Exactly what that means to Dursley um, or to your organization is is part of the customization of the model, right? So the maturity indicator is a service capability of the business or IT organization. It's uh, associated with a specific service maturity dimension, and it's the focus of the assessment. Now, the and again, the attribute is an observed characteristic of the maturity indicator, and maturity attributes are observed capabilities of the target assessment organization, which, by the way, you customize, and we'll go through that. So each within the OSIM model, there is a set of assessment questions that help drive us to determine which attributes of the maturity indicators are most appropriate or aligned to our specific organization from the as-is um, view, right? And we, we also that also helps us guide um, the decision as to how uh, we're going to construct our roadmap for the 2B as well. So in this particular case, the business dimension or the and uh, assessment questions are listed here. Some of them are 
Um, what are the major business drivers for this initiative? It goes on down to what are the metrics for return on investment, so, so on and so forth. And they are intentionally open-ended um, because if you get down to a yes or no question, when you're working with your stakeholders um, and you're going to bring everybody together, uh, probably you're going to bring the uh, – I'm sorry, you're going to bring everybody together in the assessment process, right? Uh, in the organization, the business stakeholders, the the technology stakeholders, the operation department, you know, the programmers, and you're going to ask them these questions in, in order to gain as much information as possible to make a recommendation about the current maturity level and where you believe uh, they they and and the roadmap that can help them achieve their desired vision. So. You know, the, it's important if you do customize the model that you don't uh, customize it in such a way that you ask uh, assessment questions that are yes or no answers, right? That may help to a certain degree, but a yes or no question doesn't drive um, a discussion will, which will help uncover some of the underlying challenges for implementing a particular SOA service. So here we have the method, the method dimension, and you can see the maturity indicator uh, at uh, composite services or level five, which is service-oriented modeling. Uh, the maturity attributes of this particular indicator, which is the formal use of a SOA architectural design, construction, and deployment methodology for the implementation of services, is utilized, right? Um, some of the maturity indicators to lead us to believe that we are at maturity level five would be a formal and recognized methodology for the creation, development, deployment, and management is in practice, right? So we're, we're using the attributes as, uh, to, to, as guideposts themselves to, to determine from the information that we glean as part of the assessment where on this, you know, matrix our organization fits, right? So it's important to customize the framework to reflect the overall services strategy, right? And the maturity indicators are, are there to focus on alignment of EA vision, industry standards, for example, in this case, MOSA and MESA use, internal enterprise architecture standards and techniques, SOA standards in general, and enabling the service location transparency. Um, our assessment questions, just to review, are intended to identify the SOA maturity attributes of the assessed organization, right, which help us determine what maturity we are currently at. Um, for example, if we wanted to extend the model, uh, in this case, for our DDB example, the current base model indicator for the business dimension is a SOA maturity assessment of the OSIM business. Uh, it, I'm sorry, this a SOA maturity assessment of the OSIM business dimension is conducted by identifying the formal definition of the documentation of the organization's business drivers and processes. Now we can extend this by adding standard standards requirements. Uh, standards adoptions, in this case maybe MESA or OSA EAI. Um, and so this may be SOA standards in spe uh, specifically, specific standards that we think are necessary in order for us to achieve technical direction or industry standards. It could also include, for example, outsourcing services or using cloud computing. Now, in our case, um, we've decided to modify uh, the maturity, the business dimension maturity indicator as follows. We've, we've actually placed in the maturity attributes, new attributes, which lead us to uh, make some particular decisions about what maturity level we're at. Right? And this is necessary for DDB to understand current adoption and approach across all of their organizations for the implementation of SOA and particularly SOA in the context of their industry standards, MESA and, and OSA EAI, and the implementation of the uh, reference model that we talked about earlier. So here, for example, uh, if we look at, let's see, componentized at level three, 
Um, we're look, the indicator is formal business process definition for implementing the most uh, business flows, right? And we're going to make a distinction about the particular component that we are evaluating or organization or department. And we're going to say that the cross-organizational behavior would be um, measured by seeing or, or uh, verifying and validating that the organizational acceptance of MIMOSA or MESA vision is in place and that the strategic planning is, the, is in the process of being conducted. All right, so it's evolving and the business components are not integrated into the value chain, right? So in this case, you know, componentize is not really where we want to be. We certainly want to be probably up near um, composite services. So as we, you know, go up in, in maturity or, or uh, uh, we're in adoption of Mimosa and Mesa standards, we're going to see at level five that Mimosa and our Mesa EA is defined in terms of BPM flows and that the uh, the organization, or DDB in this case, uh, our business drivers are elements of the overall global business value chain. So we're actually seeing adoption of, of this uh, particular implementation uh, of MESA uh, in, in context of our EA, and uh, we're seeing um, the actual adoption across uh, our business through the transformation of the value chain. So if we look at the architecture dimension, um, architect, uh, the base model maturity indicator was identifying those service components that have been designed and are deploying using formal SOA methods, principles, patterns, frameworks, or techniques. And we're going to extend that in this case by saying that, um, well, from a standards point of view, that service component, components are designed using MESA industry best practices and industry so reference uh, architecture models that implement the MIMOSA standards. And that from an outsourcing point of view, because we have an outsourcing strategy with respect to our, our case study, that service components are designed to allow substitution of outsourced services, right? So we so we don't get you know basically um, into a situation where we're we're only able to implement services that are developed internally. We can actually outsource them, and that is you know the value in the global uh, value chain. So as we see here, um, and we'll go back. Uh, I thought there would be little red circles here. Um, we 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 have the uh, architecture dimension uh, and the model that's been updated. Uh, now with our new maturity indicators and our new maturity an attributes, which lead us to determine what uh, so maturity level uh, our organization is able to achieve. And if we look at SOA or level five, again the maturity indicators, service components are are designed into Mesa industry best practices and industry SOA reference architecture models that implement the MIMOSA standards. And the integration, and, and, and we're seeing this, you know, uh, integrated throughout the enterprise. Uh, it's integrated enterprise-wide, and you know, the primary attribute of that uh, w that we would need to verify would be most systems are using Mesa so a reference architecture based on implementations that have implemented MIMOSA standards for internal interoperability. So. You know, as we were to go through our assessment, or in this case, reassessment of our organization, we would find uh, evidence that our applications and our business are actually being managed to this particular maturity indicator uh, as defined by the maturity attributes. So, you know, as part of this, if we were a practitioner and, and working with the business, uh, consulting with the business to determine what the maturity um, ought to be, the 2B state, right, the vision, um, we've determined that in our case for DDB, we have to be at, uh, we want to be able to achieve dynamically reconfigurable services at the business view or at the business layer. And um, that we believe because of our outsourcing model that internally we really don't need to achieve more than level five for internal services, because if we outsource 
big, you know, significant sections of our business um, to to other business partners that will take care of the the ability to do dynamic reconfigurable business services. That may or may not be an assumption that works out, but that's the assumption the business makes here in this particular case. Now, when we did our original OSIM uh, assessment, we found that the business that DDB was at these maturity levels for across the different dimensions, right? So uh, their applications are pretty siloed, and they're using layered architecture and some componentization, but you know, really they're back down at the the old object-oriented modeling techniques and not really using it in a service-based um, method. Um, you know, their operations department a little bit more mature. So. Now we can actually define the roadmap, and this is where a little art comes into play. Now we have in the OSIM uh, document, you know, the the value achieved or the business value of achieving each particular level. Um, but you have to, as a consultant, kind of determine what will be the value um, of achieving each maturity level um, with respect to the mission and vision, right? In the case of, of DDB, um, we've decided that we're going to need to have dynamically reconfigurable business processes. And again, our outsourcing strategy is probably going to take that into consideration. Um, that internally, we probably won't be able to get our development and IT team to become, um, at least initially, more than SOA enabled or level five because we've got a long way to go here anyway. So we're looking to outsource, you know, initially. Internally, we're going to do a lot of training and infrastructure modernization in order to achieve level five, and then we're probably going to go through a set of incremental um, uh, steps uh, of reevaluating using OSIM to determine whether our strategy is working and to determine next steps for, uh, that may be necessary in order to achieve our vision. So this is a, a good point uh, to, to actually talk about conclusions and then go into a discussion. Um, it's, a, it's really important to customize OSIM. You can certainly use the base model. Um, in fact, you might want to use the base model initially to gather information and make a, an initial decision about where in the maturity matrix your organization lies. Now remember that um, when you are doing an assessment that uh, it's, it's context sensitive. If you're going to be getting information about maturity um, with respect to the organization or application uh, uh, business mission initiative that you're focused on. You could do this enterprise-wide, but you kind of get an enterprise-wide high-level picture out of that. If you go down to a specific initiative and you really drill down into the, the groups that are the stakeholders on the business side as well as the IT side, you get a more granular uh, picture. So you need to customize OSIM to focus on you know, your EA strategy, but also industry standards adoption, um, internal enterprise standards uh, implementation of techniques, uh, certain techniques like the implementation of virtualization for, for implementing cloud computing may be one of yours. Um, so a standards alignment of the EA vision, as I've said, and OSIM assessments can be used to help uh, refine organizations' services strategy and approach. And this is a technique, it's a framework, and it's there for you to modify um, as necessary. So Heather, I think we probably have some questions on tab. That is if Heather is still online. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Uh, in the Q and A. Um, all right, you just so came we on. had Heather. one really good question that's been generating a lot of uh, traffic on the chat. And what's the relationship between OSIM and ITIL? The relationship between OSIM and ITIL. So ITIL, if I rem if I heard that correctly, is um, really a set of uh, best practices and techniques and 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 approaches for implementing uh, uh, your operational infrastructure mostly, right? 
um, and and the they kind of go hand in hand when we're looking to implement operational best practices as part of your SOA implementation. So, I think if you look at the uh, at the model, uh, at the original matrix, and we'll go right up here to the example here with Dursley drill bit. Um, you know, ITIL would be one element potentially for your organization to consider uh, when defining maturity and loading the model with respect to the infrastructure and management layer. So it may be that you want um, certain ITIL processes or techniques to be used um, as uh, across the organization as part of your vision, right? But you know that, you know, adopting in a, you know, kind of all-for-nothing strategy is probably not going to be successful. And what you can do is actually load the model in an incremental fashion so that as you adopt services um, and go from uh, the service foundation levels to, uh, you know, through services and all the way up to level seven, that you're implementing or you're seeing the implementation uh, you, you're, you're actually witnessing the implementation of certain ITIL techniques. So I see that they go hand in hand, actually. Heather? Thank you, Andres. Another question that we've had online is why are base assessment questions open rather than multiple choice? Oh, well, I, I, I thought I went through that. Well, if they were multiple choice, you just kind of get yes or no. And um, remember, this is a, a consulting technique, right? And the more information you have, uh, the better off you're going to be to make decisions about how you effectively implement um, your SOA strategy. So, you know, when you're going through this process, and I've gone through quite a few of them using uh, OSIM, um, you're going to be working with uh, different stakeholders. Now, let's take the business stakeholders, right? And you might ask these open-ended questions. Can you give me, for example, um, a document which defines your, you know, strategic vision? Well, you would not imagine how many uh, customers that I've had that kind of looked at each other like, no, we don't really have a document. I mean, we got a power. We got one power. Well, we got a couple of PowerPoints, Sue. Um, well, yes, Bob, but, I mean, we, we got the whiteboard thing. I mean, so really when you see that, you know that they haven't sat down and agreed amongst themselves what their business strategy is. So certainly you wouldn't put them up at level seven if that's the case, right? Um, and you would that would help you understand, well, you know, they maybe need to define a well, uh, uh, an agreed upon business strategy. And that business strategy has got to define the business process uh, that they plan to implement, and and again, you would not believe how many customers that or, or in organizations um, don't understand the the business processes that they plan to actually implement in their IT systems. They just haven't really considered it. They know that they have an initiative, they can see the end game, they just haven't actually thought out the process for implementing the business process. Heather, we have another one? Yes, we do. Um, so from Simon Finney, is there any experience of CMMI-focused organizations moving into a SOA environment and how they adopt OSIM? Well, you know, we, we believe that, uh, and this has been asked of us before, you know, how, why didn't you just use CMMI or, you know, why is this another maturity uh, process and so on and so forth, right? So. We found the need to implement um, OSIM primarily because uh, we want to scope the definition uh, and process for assessment, right? The def I'm sorry, the definition of SOA uh, and the process uh, of assessing the target organization. And, and so with CMMI, it's a very broad approach, right? But it, and, and it's important and it may be used in context with OSIM. So you might have uh, CMMI being used side by side with OSIM uh, as a way to determine implementation maturity. Um, but you know, when we focus on SOA, quite frankly speaking, there's more to IT and the business than just implementing 
services. And what we're going to be doing when we focus on a, a, an OSIM assessment are on those high-value targets that are going to help achieve our business mission or vision. So uh, w we found that this really helped define or better define the scope in the context of implementing services or cloud computing than simply going to uh, a more broader model. Heather, we have another one? Yes. Um, we've had a question on the time dimension. In concern of an assessment on the time of an organization needs to step from level N to level N plus one. Right, so how much time does it take, right? Now, time is not a, actually integrated into the SOA uh, assessment process, and, and it's not in, integrated into OSIM either, really. Uh, what we're, these are snapshots in time, right? So you're, theoretically, if you did a snapshot day by day, which we know you're not going to do, right, you would see a, a, a um, continuous in a, uh, migration from one particular maturity level to the next over a long period of time, um, or a short period of time if you decided to outsource pieces or do a Greenfields implementation. It's really dependent upon how you decide to approach your um, SOA or cloud computing strategy. Um, so time is really you know, dependent upon your a bunch of different things, right? So one is your enterprise architecture, uh, your business mission and vision, uh, your techniques that you're applying, um, and, and OSIM is there to help you actually make a decision about where you are from a maturity point of view to determine if you're going in the right direction um, at a particular point in time. So, you know, I would suggest, and it is a good point, that, you know, you, you reassess you know, uh, at, at very important milestones, right? So um, you set up this maturity roadmap, and the roadmap is broken down into project attributes and timelines. And within that, you would actually do additional maturity assessments to determine if you're making progress. Now, you know, i got to be honest with you, OSIM probably is most valuable to the enterprise architects and the executives who are seeking to oversee the transformation process. On a day-by-day -day scale, um, the average developer or IT guy probably isn't going to see a lot of value from OSIM, um, you know, because they're making very small incremental adoptions in order to get from one maturity level to the next. But it would be a great dashboard tool, right? Heather? Thank you, Andres. The next question we have is how to determine the best scope. Most companies have different maturity per business unit. Oh, absolutely. I, as I said during the presentation, um, you want to scope this down uh, at, a, at, at a level of granularity which is going to give you some actionable um, results. So I would say that you take your SOA vision or your cloud computing vision and you go by service, right? And you you drill down into each one of those services and do an assessment uh, with respect to the stakeholders that are uh, supporting the implementation of that particular service. So if you did it across your entire enterprise, you know, you might not get any actionable uh, results. If you did it by service, then I, I guarantee you probably would. Now, if you go back to the well and it's the same folks every time that you're assessing, well, that could be an issue too. So you might want to do, you know, if it's the same individuals you're having to assess, you might want to have uh, an assessment session that focuses on different initiatives and you break the different um, roadmaps down by initiative so that you don't, you know, have to go back to the well and these uh, stakeholders every single time. Thank you, Andras. I think we have time for one more question. How does this work with TOGAF? Do they overlap? Uh, well, TOGAF is 
you know, uh, the primary methodology in the open group for addressing enterprise architecture, and it is, you know, worldwide most recognized method. Uh, it, it would be the methodology that you would adopt for implementing your enterprise architecture, and there are kind of hooks down into implementation architecture. So I see this as, uh, you know, OSIM is absolutely um, part and parcel of the process you would use to apply in your implementation phase as you go around the crop circle to determine your as is to be and so it would inform your 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 strategic vision it would inform your business architecture and it would inform your development practices and processes and all that kind of stuff as you made it around to deployment uh at the top of the you know when you went from 11 to 12 so i i actually think it's uh a, a perfect tool to use when implementing TOGEF, especially when it comes to cloud computing and service-based implementations and visions. You know, Heather, I, I, I bet you that some folks are interested in maybe tooling. Uh, so if I were to, you know, I've had this question before, so I, you know, since I wasn't asked the question uh, right up front, I'll go into it myself, and that is that uh, you know, do you see tools to support, uh, or you just, you know, uh, do you yourself use tools uh, as an IBM organization, or do you see customers using tools to help adopt OSIM? And absolutely, we do. We uh, we see uh, there are, there are organizations like Capgemini. Uh, I know that I, IBM has a tool. I know SAP is has got a SOA assessment tool. Um, all of these organizations. Uh, are, are certainly approaching um, modernization in different ways, but I, I, we have a, a SOA, or I'm sorry, an, a uh, OSIM assessment tool we call ART, which is the SOA assessment and roadmap tool, and uh, it helps us actually gather all of the information as we go through the assessment process and then um, effectively visualize the uh, results of the OSIM assessment when we're working with customers. So um, we're really hoping that other vendors uh, or, or customers take up the mantle and look to actually operationalize these assessments as well. Heather, anything else? No, I think we're out of time for this webinar. Andres, this has been very interesting, and I think the questions that we've had come in have been very insightful and thoughtful as well. So I want to thank the audience Excellent questions.